Raised Rowdy. <laughs> Welcome to Raised Rowdy Podcast, episode 190-ish. <laughs> I'm Nikki T. I'm Kurt Ozon. We got Connor Smith on the pod. Connor, up, thanks for being here with us in the early morning. We Man, we're proud to be here. It's, uh, yeah, no, this was by request. Like I said before, I, I, I wanted to come hang out with you guys. We got to play with, with Kurt, what, two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? Up in Maine. Yeah, I would say. And uh, God, time's just this summer's flying by, man. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But we were up there, and um, I mean, we, it was our first. We've never played with Luke before, and first time getting to do that, which is obviously a massive opportunity. Yeah. Um, and so we got to play a show, and, and we kind of show up, and we've been playing fairs and festivals all summer. You know, in the middle of nowhere, like you know, the funnel cake fest and like the pig race fest sort of thing. Oh yeah. And we uh, used to do those. You know yeah. it. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> And so we show up to the Luke show, and then it's like full catering, full backstage. They've got like go karts backstage, and it's like, God, oh, I missed this. <laughs> and uh, we we sat down for for breakfast that day, and Kurt sat with us, and which is a very rare thing for you know somebody in the established camp to do. And so that stuck out to me. And then uh, we just got to hang hang a good bit that that day. And so Kurt's a good dude, so I was excited to be on. Appreciate this. it, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, that was in Bangor, Maine, and it's uh, if you haven't met up there, it's is it Bangor? Yeah, not Banger. It's Bangor. <laughs> I probably got booed on stage. No, <laughs> I, think, I think Luke said Banger, Maine. Also, I mean, it's more fun to say Banger anyway, yeah. <laughs> for sure. But this is like the um, the backstage hang at this venue is insane. Yeah, it's it's like deal. they're coming up on the. Uh, Lake Winnipesaukee venue, a uh, Guilford kind of vibes where it's like... It's funny you said that. Sorry to cut you off, but I was just about to bring that up because the first show I ever played was at Guilford. Oh. Which, which I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but like... No, let's go. Uh, <laughs> up, up there in... Was it New, ha New Hampshire? Yeah. yeah. It was a, so it was literally the first like kind of legit tour I, show I'd ever played. It was with Thomas Rhett. We were on that whole tour with him and Park McCollum, and the first show was up in Guilford. And so I show up that day. And I just expected that every venue was like that. No, nope. <laughs> you know? because we show up that day and it's like next to a lake. They have like every amenity, everything possible. After the show, they give you like a full lobster catering with mm -hmm. like ice sculptures and just whiskey like, bar. Yeah, it's cigars, just like fire <laughs> yeah. pit, like yeah. it's perfect weather. And so like as a 21 year old kid, it's his first show ever. You're like, I did it. This is every <laughs> night. It's going to be like this. And that's not the case. Uh, there are a few exceptions in that one, and then the main one was was one of them too. Yeah, they do it right. My first ever big show was uh, Faster Horses. It oh. was like my first time touring with the Nashville recording artist or whatever. Uh, when I played Janet Kramer, and we were like, we weren't direct support, but we were like two or three before. It was like us, Eli Young, and then like Tim McGraw. So there was for me, there was like a shit ton of people there, and catering was like steak and lobster and stuff. And then the next day we went and played a fair and it was just like <laughs> man, man, mom, pop, pa's like hamburgers that have been sitting out all day or sandwiches with like flies and stuff. Oh, dude, we played, uh, you know, and you'll wake up when you're on the road. It's a couple of days in, you'll wake up at like, you know, 10, 30, 11. Right. So your first meal is lunch. And we were playing like a rodeo festival thing down in Mississippi. So you wake up and we're like, all right, let's go get some food. And like lunch that day was fried Philly cheesesteaks. <laughs> So not just like a Philly cheesesteak, but like it was fried. Send it. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I, this is going to be my first meal today. This is my breakfast, you know? Yeah, it's your last one because you just go right back to bed. You yeah. Know, you <laughs> just miss the show. So like that's that's like what touring is is mainly, I feel like. And there's something like, I don't mind being on the road for like long stretches of time. But it's like if I'm not eating well, yeah. then, it, then it's like everything else starts just to go downhill. The, the food's the biggest thing, dude. Like, yeah. People ask me, because I kind of like, I I don't love barbecue anymore. Right. Radio tour will end that or whatever. You know what, what I'm saying? Whatever, <laughs> yeah. Like, you get that immediately, because, like, the amount of times that you get catered the fattiest barbecue mm -hmm. at yeah. these festivals uh, from, you know, their local joint, mm -hmm. and then you're just like, dude. So then you get home, and, you know, you got Ed, Lisa Martins in Nashville. It's like, well, I don't want to eat barbecue anymore. No. Yeah. And Anyways. it's also, it's like a, almost like a trope amongst us. Like, any touring guys, it's like. You, you show up, you go to catering at some festival or f not festival really, but fairs, and they're like, "We got the best barbecue in the state <laughs> every time." Yeah, and they say that every time. It's like, why do people say that? This is obviously not, you know. Dude, I was I was up in uh... also hamburgers are not barbecue. 
I yeah, feel like, I yeah, mean, yeah, like yeah. you can barbecue. I mean, like you can grill out, but like when I think eating barbecue, I don't think hamburgers. Right? Just depends on the regionality. There's people that call that barbecuing. Really? Yeah, really. They call the act of grilling barbecuing. Right? Well, I I say I understand that. that. Yeah. So when they're saying, "Yeah, we have barbecue," they're saying we grilled out all this stuff. What is that's a hot like, dog barbecue? I mean, not really. So but that's like people calling uh, so like all sodas Coke. Yeah. In certain areas. Gotcha. Yeah. Exactly. It's, that, I think they need to change that, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's just a, it's like almost like a colloquialism, which mm-hmm. is a big word. But I, I, I'm impressed. I'm yeah, impressed. see that? I'm, I am smart, kind of almost. I was yeah. in. Uh, <laughs> I was on radio tour. Speaking of radio tour, radio tour food, I was up in New Hampshire again, and uh, <laughs> and I thought I was in Maine. And oh. so I like show up to the video. I show up to like the meeting, you know, and it's just like the people that work at the radio station. And I'm like, man, this is so cool. Never been to Maine before. Like whatever. And uh, she was like, well, you're you're close. And I was oh, like, oh gosh, no. that's okay. awkward. And so then they were like, you have to have our local, our local famous thing. And it was garlic bread pizza. It was eight thirty in the morning. Oh god, it's <laughs> like an early morning radio interview. Yeah. yeah. So they had garlic bread pizza, which is as dense reckless right. yeah. as it sounds and it's reckless. 8 30 <laughs> it's 8 30 in the morning dude and so i'm just like i'm i'm stuck between a rock and a hard place of like i have to eat it. this you want the ad eat this girl <laughs> and i probably ate the pizza and didn't get the ad you know yeah. <laughs> so. well the thing is i mean everybody's proud of where they're from you know and mm-hmm. i you know being before i, I was in nashville it. yeah i was from pittsburgh and it's in pittsburgh it's permani brother sandwiches right yeah, yeah. so i don't know if you've ever had that but I love Permanis, and it's great food when you're drunk at 2 a.m. to have. It's coleslaw and French fries on top of a sandwich. It's awesome. But that's not something you want to eat at 8.30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the foods that a place would probably be known for isn't something you'd want to eat at 8.30. Unless it's like uh, like Denver has that chili they put on all their breakfast stuff, right? The like green chili sauce. So maybe that you could put on whatever. But I don't know. I don't know if there's any real good regional foods that are 830 foods Kurt, where are you from i'm from south florida okay it's just such a melting pot down there it there wasn't like a one like monocultural identity it's just kind of like you know it's like great cuban cuban food and then you know we i would eat barbecue or whatever it was just kind of like everything yeah cuban food. so it wasn't like this is like one you know, thing it's not like being from like augusta and like eating those cheese sandwiches or whatever yeah. or whatever What's yours? Like, what's from where? Well, you're I mean, from? I'm I'm from Nashville, so I was trying to trying to figure that out, but I don't really know. I mean, Nashville has really good food, but I don't think we have like our thing. Maybe it's hot chicken, huh? Hot, yeah. I guess hot chicken, yeah. but I'm not a hot chicken guy, so yeah. I but think, I um, you know, Nashville's changed so much since I've moved here, and I've been here since 2012, and um, and like a lot of things that I used to like about Nashville when I, you know, when I first moved here have changed, and that's sad, you know, and. Some things are better, but one thing is just like the food in Nashville's gotten so much better since yeah, I moved here. I mean, traffic is worse, and like you know, rent and blah blah blah, and all the things and all the cool spots are like hotels now and like blah blah blah. But it's like there are so much better places to eat. Yeah, yeah, it's been wild for me because growing up in Nashville, it's always been home. I, I, I kind of always thought it will be home, but then like it has changed so much in the last five years because it was already growing. And then COVID happened; it, it exploded. And it's like, it's just a different city. It's a completely different place. And, and uh, I mean, the reason Nashville's exploded so much is because it's such a special city. Like, yeah. there's there's so much about this town um, that is just, like, incredible. And so I'm really proud to be from here. But at the same time, it's like, dude, I feel like I'm driving in Atlanta nowadays. Yeah. And, like, that's tough. Yeah. It, it was kind of in this, like, Goldilocks zone of, like, big enough to have everything you would ever want. But, like small enough to where it's like you can find parking places and yeah. stuff and now it's kind of like so it's, it's like i can't even drive to places i'd like uber even if i don't plan on drinking just for yeah. parking yeah sometimes. it's cheaper to uber now yeah, yeah. man I, f- I feel that way about my hometown too but in a different way it's just all of the work left the area so yeah just you get to watch it go the opposite way instead of being developed it goes to being underdeveloped yeah. right it's uh, a weird thing because I mean, if you're not growing, you're dying, right? Yeah. And so Nashville is just such an incredible city and it's booming so much. And I love that for the city. And at the same time, you know, you're selfish, you know, because I've been here since, what, 06 or something. And so yeah. it's like, 
it's like I miss some of the old roots. I mean, even Franklin. I, gr- I grew up in like Franklin, Brentwood mm-hmm. area. And Franklin, I mean, I remember Leaper's Fork, right, was like the middle of nowhere growing up. And that's where I started playing uh, the puckets out in Leaper's Fork. It's now Fox and Lock. But like I was seven years old. Every Thursday night, we'd do the open mic nights. And now if you go out there on a s- Thursday night to do an open mic night, you got to like register a month before you're sitting out there for five hours. You know what I mean? It's just a different, different thing. And now Leaper's Fork is like living in Nashville, Mm -hmm. which is crazy. Wait, seven years old. Yeah. I started writing songs at six. Wow. And, uh, it was just always what I was going to do. I just wanted to write though. I just wanted to be a songwriter. Uh, I signed a BMI when I was nine. Um, yeah so like <laughs> i was picking boogers i mean i still pick boogers but i, I was, was like, <laughs> i was too i was just writing songs about yeah. it you know so what was your first song ever do you remember or yeah i went to the grand old opry saw how catch him sing uh sure love um and i came home and i i like i kept i like rewrote the words to the melody of mm-hmm. that song uh which uh thankfully he didn't sue me for it but uh <laughs> i remember that was my first song and i just remember coming downstairs you know super young but I remember coming downstairs and, and like just feeling so proud. I had a guitar I didn't know how to play. And uh I you know, just something like like uh if I could if I could count ten stars in the sky it would be a dream come true. It's like something like that. And I remember playing it for my mom and I remember like how proud she was, like how excited. And there was something in me, I think, when like I got that response from her and my dad that was like Oh dang, that elicits an emotion, and so I literally like became obsessed with it. Started doing it every day. I get home and I just write until baseball practice. Yeah, and uh, it was just kind of one of those phases that never burned out. You know, I remember her. That's awesome. I remember being a little kid and I learned the intro to Stairway to Heaven. Of course, I wasn't nine. I was probably eleven or twelve or something, and I could barely play it. But I ran to my parents. They were watching a movie, and I tur- paused the movie and like boom, 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 blink, blink, and they were sure. like. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I, it's that little dopamine drip yeah, in your brain. Feels I mean, good. that's that's the beauty of music, you know. Like you get to give something to people. You know, someone I heard someone say when you're in the entertainment entertainment industry is the service industry. You know, like mm-hmm. you get to like serve people. I love that. Every night you're on stage, you know, you get to give people an emotion, and that's the best part of it. You know, yeah. to see that response, like you know, like when you're playing that solo now that we mm-hmm. talked about before the show of "Ain't No Love in Oklahoma." You see people's reaction in the pit, and that still gives you that same trigger you got at 11 when your parents were clapping for you. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of get to just like keep giving that emotion to people. It's uh, it's the opposite of that for me because I never played instruments. But my brother Steve, who is like you know 13 years older than me, would have me in the car and he'd be like, "Who sings this song?" <laughs> for sure. Right. And if I knew, he would be so happy. He fired so, up. Yeah. It was like Metallica, you know. <laughs> so it's just that. For me, was that same kind of feedback. I wasn't playing the music, but yeah. when I knew what it was, my brother loved it. Yeah. So it kind of fed me in a different way. I do know? that. I do that now for songwriters. If mm-hmm. I hear a song, I try to guess the songwriter every time, mm-hmm. and I'm pr- I'm usually wrong, but you know, <laughs> I'll get I'll get in the area. I I hear that Hardy specifically. You can hear, yeah. especially if someone when they're cutting the song uses some of the cadence that you know Hardy for, yep. and then I'll hear Singleton in songs. For sure, yeah. Yep. I'll hear Josh Osborne, Mac yeah. and in a ton of songs. Yeah, I'll hear Randy Montana mm-hmm. in a lot of songs. And yep. I mean, I obviously I get to cheat because I get to write with these guys, yeah. so I know, you know, what they're doing in the rooms. That's, yep. that's bringing that about. But I think, I mean, the best songwriters in Nashville are the guys that have that their own signature thing. Yeah, what a huge compliment it is. Yeah, to even be someone that be considered that you'd be able to guess their name. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it. It's indelible once you know what you're looking for, almost. You know, now mm-hmm. there's, there's people that can sound similar, but, and that's when you get tricked. You know, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's good. That means that what someone did is leaking into the rest of the thing. You know, they're making their imprint on the industry and in songwriting. As I mean, a whole. I can guess Ashley Gorley a mile away too. Yeah. You know, like there's just there's a certain uh, codes he has, but uh, but those great songwriters, the reason they ha- they have that signature thing, and then they like. I mean, Hardy has done it for the last five, six years where he has shaped the genre of country music yeah. around his thing. Ashley Gorley's done it for the last 12 years mm-hmm. where he has shaped the, the, the sound of country music to fit what he does, which yeah. is an unbelievable thing. Yeah. Um, and, and like that is, like you said, that's the biggest compliment you could give a songwriter. Yeah. And you're training the listeners too, you know? Like this is what you're being fed that you enjoy. Of course, more of it you enjoy, you know. Yeah. So it's it's 
a formula, but it's not a formula. They're crafting different things every time. It's just those little bits and pieces of things that they use consistently that really makes it. Well, it's the same thing for an artist. You go, you can hear a song, you can go, that's a loop. That's even if they're not singing, say I hear a song, a pitch song from a a demo, I'd be like, that sounds like a Luke Combs song. That sounds like a Cody Johnson song. That sounds like a Thomas Red song. It's the same things that songwriters can have Mm -hmm. where they have this, their own signature thing. And if they can match it, if they can match that with a certain artist at the time, I mean, they could have infinite amount of success. That's what Hardy and Ernest have done with Morgan, right? Mm-hmm. They had a specific thing. They matched it with, with Morgan, and it, and it created this just firestorm. Mm-hmm. And now Morgan has shaped the entire genre of what country music sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to that in terms of artistry. I mean, think of people that you talk about 20 years in the past, yeah. right? So in rap music, it's Eminem, it's Jay-Z, it's... Notorious B.I.G., right? In country music, it's Garth Brooks. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the the people that you'll be talking about not just 20 years from then, but 40 years and 60 years and 80 years, you know? Wallen's becoming one of those guys. 100%. You know? And I think as an artist, that's, that's the... That's the dream, and that's kind of the hardest part of it is, you know, there's there's two ways you can kind of shape your, your artist career. You can try to match your thing to what's popular, or you can try to step out and and do something different that will hopefully evolve the genre to a certain way or at least carve your own lane in that. And, yeah. and that's where the greatest artists break through. Uh, but that's also the hardest thing to do. Yeah. I talk about like Eric Church as an example. And I say, I feel like Eric Church, and I don't know this, but I feel like he would feel more happiness in steering the genre 1% than he would of another number one song right or another 10 number one songs and there's there's different motivations for all of that well it's true because eric has had what seven number ones Mm -hmm. like which is a crazy low number Mm -hmm. for how massive he is right he's just had that diehard fan base yeah yeah he just did it his own way at every turn you see the documentary he's about to put out Mm. no he so they just announced that he's going to put out a documentary um, on like PBS about the stagecoach performance that oh, had all I the controversy. Yes. Oh yeah. And like that is him in a nutshell where it's like, he knew people would be pissed off. He also knew it was going to create a moment for the diehard fans, the church choir, as he calls them. Mm-hmm. And so he chose to do that. Right. Yep. And like that takes balls. I would not have the balls to do that, to like get in front of 30, 40, 50,000 people and everything they're expecting you to do, you do the opposite. And, and cause dude, I've, I've, I've done shows where like you're sitting there for an hour and 15 minutes and you know that like people are just not into it. And Mm -hmm. that is one of the most uncomfortable feelings. But the fact that he had the balls to sit up there and do that and then like do a whole documentary about it is pretty cool. I didn't even consider what he was feeling on stage because you read all about it. It's like everything was slow. It was all with the gospel choir and blah, blah, blah. And then it was like I never even thought like what he must have known that it was going to go over. No, essentially I mean, like a lead balloon, I guess. <laughs> right? Is that kind of how it was received? Well, I'm sure it was great, but I mean, in the in the documentary, they talk about like him and his band. They're they're watching droves of people leave, and he's just doing it. And he's you can tell he's just so proud of it. You know, it's just yeah. like that is a different level of artist. And and Eric Church is like my favorite country artist. He, he's my guy that has shaped a ton of who I am as a songwriter and what I try to look like as you know as an artist and making decisions. Because I respect him so much, but like, man, that's a different level. Yeah. It's it's one of those things where it's crazy to think about it like this, but we are still talking about that show that didn't work. 100%. Right? <laughs> a million percent. We're still talking about Woodstock 99 that was a shit storm. Yeah. Right? Sometimes having a moment, even if it's good right, or bad, is a moment still. No know? bad press kind of vibes. Yeah. yeah. So... I don't know if he did that with intent, right? But just the fact that he is big enough culturally where we, when he has a show on a major platform and it is that far left of center that we talk about it and we make a documentary about it. It's not like he's losing fans, right? Right. Absolutely not. It made his fans love him more. But it's it's also, that is a, that is a certain, uh, that is a certain moment that was created by the thousands of decisions he's made his entire career to always go left instead of right. Yeah. To always do the thing people don't expect. Mm-hmm. And like that's a, 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 a bigger moment. 
but like that moment was created by every moment he made along the 20 years yep we got to play a, a festival within the summer and got to watch side stage and like it was just like this magical moment for me as just this massive air church fan right and um and he said he said on stage he's like we've been doing this for 25 years and i think for me as an artist and for every artist it's hard to remember that a lot of the times because it's like you know this town is so revolved around you know what is what have you done for me the last three months Mm -hmm. the last six months how fast you know how fast did you grow in this last year and then you look at these guys that have really established something that'll really go down in the hall of fame that'll really like change the essence of country music and um and you know be legends in the genre it's like nah man they like grinded it out and they like just went with their gut for 25 years and and it and it worked out yeah I went and saw him do the acoustic storyteller kind of thing at his bar. Um, what's it called? Churches? Yeah. Um, it was fucking no, it's awesome. Chiefs. 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 Yeah, yeah. Sorry, church is such a good place. <laughs> like, damn, it's 10 in the morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it was it, just him telling the story about him getting a start and what he decided to do and pivot from what he was doing. It was just, I mean, it was absolutely incredible show. If you listen to his first record one thing I've, I've, I've like studied his career but you listen to that first record he ever put out Sinners Like Me every single song on that record or at least you know 80% are him telling the fan and the listener who he is yeah like every like go listen to that record every song is him going this is who I am this is the type of person I am like uh, from Sinners Like Me to uh, How About You to uh, Before She Does even like that song is him saying this is who I am and it's it's him 20 years ago 25 years ago going if i'm going to build a career i'm going i have to set a foundation of this is this is the type of artist i am and just to have that foresight is super super cool to me and super inspiring yeah it's i mean he was building branding in a time where there wasn't social media and you could pop on and facebook live with however many fans are willing to do so and they can feel like they know you right yeah yeah and he's used the you are only going to know me through my songs so well um, and not done a ton of press and not done a ton of interviews to keep that mystery around him so that every time he does do an interview, it's huge. Yeah. Every time there is something, it's big. He's it's not, not afraid of controversy either. No, no but it's, it's hard to do that now. Oh, it's because, impossible, I think. Yeah. It, like that route, you would have to have moments that were so huge to kick it off that you can ride that, you know? I was talking to, you know, Luke after the show. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. You guys had a nice long conversation. Yeah, it was really cool. I'd never met him before, and, and I, I could not be more impressed by him as a human. Um, and we can get into that, but I was we were talking, and I was laughing. I was like, dude, you're so lucky because he slid in right before this new phase of what it means to be an artist to where like you have to every single day find a new way to sell yourself like he kind of came in that that him and like morgan was in that but that kind of last phase of becoming a new artist where like your songs Mm -hmm. you lived and died by your songs now it's honestly you live and die by your marketing which is Mm. a wild thing and and great songs always win the best songs always win yeah you see it with guys that it's like you know they put out great music they have their own sound and you know it, it'll it'll find its way um but I, I i'm literally i was telling him how jealous i am of him because it's like nowadays you know you think about the air church thing where he so much of his aura is about the mystery of it it's about the rock star of it mm-hmm. and it's like it, you can't really create that or it's very very hard to create that nowadays industry where it's all about the more you can promote yourself the you know the more wins, right? The more mm-hmm. your people see you on TikTok and Instagram, the more that you're in their head and the more that, you know, the per- the perception is that you're, you know, crushing it. And, and that's a weird thing. That's yeah. so true, man. It really is. And it's taxing for everyone. That's, I mean, we do a podcast with a lot of artists and it's taxing for everyone. You know, it's not like it's only taxing for you or it's only taxing for I can these, pay, these I, 20 people. I was thinking about the other day. I'm a massive college football fan, mm. obviously. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I was thinking about I feel like uh, TikTok and Instagram in terms of the music industry is like the NIL stuff in, like, college football where it's, like, it used to be about, you know, it's why Nick Saban retired. 
was because he was like, it used to be about developing leaders and young men and coaching great football. And now it's about the transfer portal and NIL and you have to run. It's a whole different ball game to what it, and I think it's the same thing in music. It used to be about you write great songs, you go out on the road, you grind on the road, you try to get radio success. And if all of those things come together, there was a formula to it and it worked. And now it's the wild west. Now mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, hope and pray that, you know, something pops off and whatever. And once again, I do believe good music wins. And I also like, yeah. don't want to be the artist that ever is just going to like sit here and crap on you know the just bitch the whole time yeah just yeah. the just just the way it's changed it's changed everybody has to evolve and uh and it, it's changed in a lot of great ways and there are a ton of amazing artists that i don't think would have ever gotten a chance in country music if it yeah. wasn't for um the new system uh but it, you gotta evolve with it and, it and it's a it's a very different thing man I, but i remember people talking about luke like hey man it sucks that he's not gonna make it because he doesn't look like yeah. a 10 for you sure. know and the game is constantly changing Absolutely. and what's acceptable and what is like working will the needles will move but exactly what you're saying the songs at the end of the day the best songs still win yeah they do. you know it's just the key is how do you get those eyes on that song is it going to traditional terrestrial radio is it being on the right playlists is it being in front of fans and playing them and making them sing the words back is it popping on social media and getting it to 10 million people, <laughs> right? Because yeah. when you're at a show, you're when you're starting out, you're playing to 100 people, <laughs> you know? Those 100 people could love you and they go home and tell 100 people yeah. and that's grassroots and it works. Yeah. But if you can send that song to 10 million people <laughs> all at once and those 10 million people all talk to their friends, that's when you see the bubble like really start to grow. Um, so it's constantly changing, and bro, in five years, it's going to be totally different. Different yeah. game. It'll be a whole other thing. I will say, the as someone that plays shows, I think the good thing about social media is that you can have more fans than you could before yeah. the advent of you know, the internet and social media and all this stuff like that. And I was talking to my buddy Lars yesterday while we were sitting on my porch having a cigar, and his grandfather is this fiddle player who's played for Myrtle and Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson and all this stuff. And so... Uh, we had my fiddle out, and I was showing him what I've been working on, and we were watching videos of his grandfather play. And it was, he'd tell me all these stories about how, you know, like all these big artists, they would play in like gymnasiums and stuff back in the day because there wasn't like this infrastructure. Yeah. And a big show was like theaters were like the biggest show you could play or maybe a municipal thing if they have. Now it's like we have the infrastructure to play these massive shows and everyone can find out about it. So it's like concerts are just getting huge. Yeah. Well, it's just crazy to think about like like maybe like it's it might be a coincidence but it's also like the rise of social media and like concert sizes are growing. Also. Well, especially in country. Yeah. yeah. I mean country sells more tickets than anything right now other than Taylor Swift. Yeah. Like it's 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 crazy and and um you know you, back to the Luke thing like where Luke came out and and it was like you know it was such in a pretty boy country era where like Sam Hunt had just blown up mm -hmm. and like he's kind of the new face of country music at the time and uh, it's from these very poppy songs and this incredibly good looking guy mm -hmm. you know and I was a massive Sam Hunt fan still am but same same but uh but then Luke comes and you're like well that's not gonna work because pretty boy country's in but that's the reality of how country music goes the opposite thing always wins yeah you know you think about the Zach Bryan right now like Zach came and it's like ah that's just like these weird raw poems and it's like yeah but that was the opposite of what was happening and it just it always goes back and forth and and so that's where you get back to the air church thing you get back to like the very beginning of our conversation where you go like to be an artist that actually stands out and and doesn't just try to chase the whatever successful and doesn't just try to chase the system is always going to win but like you have to do that knowing you could fail and that's a wild thing and that's what makes you know the great artists great i think yeah yeah, do you want to toe the line and make money and have a solid career, or do you want to possibly change the game? Yeah. Right? And those are two very different things. <laughs> For sure. You know? High risk, high reward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and th I'm not saying there's any right or wrong one, right, you know? No, no, no. It's just the person and what they're looking to do, you know? Um, but if you hear a song and it sounds like a Morgan Wallen song, that's probably not your song. Yeah, 100%. Right? You know? Well, I, I think, too, like, I don't know. I just think that 
as an artist, it's about authenticity. Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, you can say that all you want, but what that even means, I don't even know yet. You know, mm -hmm. um, I just turned 24. I've, you know, been putting out songs for the last three years, and that word to me is like kind of this elusive thing. Okay, like, what does that even mean? Because mm -hmm. I always want to be as as authentic as possible. I always want to write songs that like truly flow out of me. We're putting out a project um, October 4 that like is come on. Yeah. But it it I mean it's it's me kind of getting to that of just going like, all right, if what, what would I write about if, if I wasn't thinking about anything other than if it feels like I love it. Like I'm not worried about radio, I'm not worried about the label things, I'm not worried about what management thinks, I'm not worried about what Nashville thinks. Uh, I'm worried about what would I sing if nobody was listening. Yeah. And so, I mean, I went down to Texas with that kind of framework in mind, and we wrote, uh, I was, we were writing with a guy named Dwight Baker, um, who does like Flatland Calvary and Josh Abbott Band, a lot of Texas stuff. And uh, I, I literally DM'd him on Instagram, I'm a huge Flatland fan, like Flatland's like my favorite band. Same. Yep. Same. And, <laughs> and, and so I, I, I hit him up through that, and I just said, hey man, I love what you do with Flatland, would love to just write a song. And uh, he thankfully said yes, I flew out to meet him, and we, we wrote for like, two days just two and a half days together we wrote seven songs and it was just like one of those days where just like creativity was flowing clouds parted and then flatland happened to be in town that day for the austin rodeo so cleto came out we wrote with him for a day mm. um which was so cool yeah he's just the best no doubt and uh and we wrote four songs back to back to back to back and it's what this project is like yeah. just in two days we wrote these four songs and it was me writing from the most like purified vessel like just just whatever comes let it let it flow and then there's one other song on the record called faith from a farmer that i wrote by myself and yeah that song took me about a year to kind of from start to finish um but i'm excited for this project just because it, it is if nothing else i'm not i wrote it not worrying about anything other than just like i want to i want to write something that feels really special to me that feels like it is true uh it to the craft of songwriting Mm. and uh it'll be cool to put it out it's also kind of a scary thing because it gets back to what you're talking about like hey you can you know I've, I've been really blessed over the course of my career to like gain some fans and you know sell out some shows and have this thing um and it's like yeah i can keep just like doing that and putting out songs that i think that you know will connect or try to get on radio for the rest of my life but it's like man what, what would i do what would i write if like nobody was listening and if it was just me my guitar and a fire and, and so that's what this project is called the storyteller and, and it'll be cool to put it out and just see how fans react yeah man we got a chance to listen to it a little bit early so yeah. <laughs> we've we've heard um it's cool and it's different than what you've done but it's still it's not like it's drastically no, changed yeah. right it still sounds like you but it sounds like a different version of you and yeah life is about seasons right absolutely man and as you get older maybe the seasons don't come as often but when you're young when you're 15 to 20 you're figuring it out you know and then now you've had some success and you've been on the road and you've seen how these other artists get to run their camps yeah. and you know what a big tour with luke bryan looks like you know yeah. <laughs> what you got coming up you know yeah. and uh it's it's things like that that kind of help you craft your artistry. Okay, here's stuff that I saw that I want to make sure I do. But all through that, your life's changing. I saw 100%. you playing with your, your ring earlier. 100%, yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, that that, that is, because I do think everything we've done so far is authentic, because, you yeah. know, I was a 20, 21-year-old kid when I started, and so we put out songs like I Hate Alabama and Orange mm -hmm. and White and College Town. and Because and, all my buddies were in college. How I started was uh, I, I thought of the – five schools that my friends from high school went to and we go let's go play in a bar there and have them try to bring every person they know like that's mm -hmm. how it started yeah and so i was writing songs for that and it, and it connected and it was really cool and then quickly i grew up a, a lot and friends graduated college and i got married and yeah. like congrats on that thank you man and so it was like okay well now now what do i say how do i how do i grow it up and how do i kind of be authentic but also i don't want to like I'm not trying to like rebrand here, or like mm -hmm. recreate something. I, I think it's just an expansion. It's a maturity of it. And um, I'm really proud of these songs as a songwriter, which like I said, like that's all I cared about was yeah. writing great songs, being a part of country music, being a part of telling stories, which is the best part about this genre. And, uh, and so it'd be cool to see, like I said, just what the fans think of these songs. Cause I, I, I have said from the beginning, like I want to, 
you know, have a career where my fans are able to grow up with me and kind of mature with me. And yeah. they all grad, they, most of them graduated college too, and they're on this mm -hmm. new chapter of life. And so, I don't know, man. We're learning every day. I, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just trying <laughs> to trust my gut. Finally, someone says it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one does. I well, don't think. I'm, man, I I really thought everybody had it all figured out. Yeah, no, know? it's it's <laughs> me too, brother. I thought I was supposed to, but yeah, uh, and. Uh, I worked at a record label for a year and a half, yeah. and so many talented people, artist-wise, you, you know, just workers-wise, you know, managers, suit-wise, yeah, everything. <laughs> but you also see that they're all figuring it out as they go, and even if they have something figured out, it changed, mm -hmm. right? Like social media, if they had social media figured out two years ago when I worked sure. there, now it's that's not the same, Wild you know? West, yeah. So it's, it's everybody is constantly trying to figure it out and everybody's trying to do what is them, yeah. you know? Um, you don't want to make any of your old fans mad, but you also want them to stay with you when you're going on your journey, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that takes time, you know? It definitely I, does. I, I kind of, I released the timeline in my head a long time ago, <laughs> I, I think. And, and yeah, just, just, smart. You know, I, I think that, the slow journey is usually the better journey, I think, to build something that sustains and will mm -hmm. last. And, you know, I, I kind of just realized, like, hey, I'm, uh, my goal here is to do this for the next 30 years, next mm -hmm. 35 years, next 40 years, and to build something that will really last and not just to try to squeeze the next five years and land the perfect sound to get me on country radio. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I just I want to, I want to, uh, you know, what what I love about this job more than anything other than the the writing process and playing shows is incredible and super cool, but I love the people you get to do it around. That's what I loved about going out, getting that play a show with, with you guys is there was such a difference in that crew than any crew I've ever been around. Like, like truly. And we've been on tour with a ton of amazing people. All the artists are amazing people. They have awesome crews, but there's something so different about the Luke crew because there is like every single person, a y'all all feel like best friends we are yeah and and two there's like zero sense of superiority like like zero um and that is like i like it was like shocking to me uh how how much how much like that stuck through and i asked luke after i was like man what uh i was like what's the difference like how how are you building a culture that is so set apart from anything i've ever seen and the thing that i kind of came to in talking to him was like every person in for one, it's top down leadership, right? Like he's just an amazingly good human that like is so disassociated from who Luke Combs is on stage. And like, so he's just a good guy that, that, that is in this to develop that community, but also like so many guys in the band and on the crew are guys that Luke gave shots to like what your bass player and guitar player were the guitar tech and bass tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dustin and Jamie are two guitar players in the band that used to be luke's guitar tech like that's crazy yeah like you you know how unheard of that is like if in any other crew if your guitar player leaves you just call you know another crew's guitar player and ask and try to give him more money but yeah. like that's not luke you know luke luke like wanted to give opportunities to guy that that he loved and so those guys are so grateful it, it, it stewards a level of humility and and it, it allows them to like trust luke to go like hey if luke asked me to treat people a certain way i'm gonna do that you know what i mean and that was i mean the tour manager he met him at a boot barn right like he, yes that's my favorite story yeah <laughs> like luke combs is at a boot barn he's just put out hurricane and him and cappy luke's manager are there he's buying boots and the guy's like man i really like i love your music love what you're doing and luke's like oh what'd you do what'd you move to town for he's like oh, i moved to town to be a tour manager and then the uh the boot barn manager comes or the boot barn manager comes up while they're talking and goes, don't you be still my best employee. And he said, right when she said that he was like, you're hired. And so we offered him the job right there. So it's like, this is a guy working a boot barn. That's now Luke Combs tour manager. Shout out Ethan shrunk. <laughs> it's like, how cool is that? Like yeah. for a guy like Luke to do things like that. And that's what is creating such a different environment out there, which I just, as an artist, man, I just, that's, that's that sort of wisdom's like gold to me just to, you know, get to hear that and get to learn from that as I kind of develop my crew. But what I was saying at the beginning is like, that's my favorite part of this is like, man, I got I got guys on the road with me that have been my best friends since high school and mm -hmm. and I get to give them jobs. I get to pay their bills. I get to like chase this dream with them like that is freaking awesome. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys that um, have done that, too, that bring their homies up with high school. But it is a two way street. You know, it's like. 
when you're given these opportunities, people got to step up, you know? Yeah, and um, it, that's why a lot of times it's easy to, to go and find someone that's done it already because they know what's expected. So when you're bringing the boys up, it's like they've got – they got to grow with your career, man. You know, it's because we used to play cover gigs at college bars. That's one thing. But it's like playing amphitheaters and stadiums and stuff. And then you've got songs and movies and on radio and all this crazy stuff going on. It's like a different level, you know. But being able to grow with them is like such an such a joy. Yeah, and if you can find the right guys, there's just a level of trust there that you can't replace, yes. you know. And and being good at music is important. Um, for sure <laughs> but yeah, it's part. not the most important thing when it comes to touring yeah. i feel like we've talked about this on the podcast a lot yeah. it's like just being with your friends is you know it's like everyone's good enough you know yeah and i and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean no, in, in a good way there's so many incredible musicians in nashville but it's like when you're on the bus or in the van or at the airport at 6 a.m or whatever it's like you don't want to be with people you don't like yeah yeah 100 percent. i so. mean dude i mean we we sacrifice so much i mean you know, I got married and then just been on tour for the last since yeah. we got married, you know. And so it's like we sacrifice so much of time with the people we love and, mm-hmm. you know, birthdays, holidays, weddings. Yes. My best friend's getting married uh, October 4th, the day my EP comes out. And we had uh, a show out in somewhere. And right when I got the date, it was like the one thing that I just called the manager and go, hey, we're canceling this show, you know, because like, but you have to like, those are like rare occasions, you know, and mm-hmm. you miss a lot of stuff. And so, if you're going to be on the road and chase after this dream, man, like the show is incredible. You know, b- band guys always say that we don't get paid for the show. We get paid for the travel. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? It's like the show is the fun part, but the show is, you know, that is like 6% of your day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like, man, who are you doing this with? Who are you chasing this dream with? And that's what I look look at with as I'm building out my crew slowly but surely. I think we got nine guys on the road, you know, nine guys that I get to pay their bills with these songs. I write. That's freaking awesome. But uh, I'm like, man, who do I want to play headline Red Rocks with and stand on that stage with tears in my eyes, like, next to? Mm -hmm. Because those are the guys that I want to do this now with, you know? Yeah. It's a lot of responsibility also. (laughs) It's like you're seven years old and you write a song. Next thing you know, it's like you got to worry about, you know, guys got kids and you want to pay their bills and it's like, routing and all this other stuff it's like you're a songwriter but now you're a ceo which is i'm sure it's stressful well, this would be for me no yeah it's ridiculous it's it's a uh, it's a stressful job but um and it's you know it's probably easier to build that crew when you're you get to that level of you know stadiums or whatever but mm-hmm. you know i mean we're we're living song to song right now you know as a new artist every new artist is right every song is like is is your next moment to try to build it a little bit bigger and grow it a little bit more and and you know it's a fragile thing and and uh, so that's that's definitely a scary thing you know I, I remember uh when we were on tour with thomas Rhett and it was the first time on a tour bus first time on this big tour and and like it was incredible and then i remember about halfway through where i think my song had just died at radio my first single had just died at radio and then like uh, just it was a lot of chaos going on for me and I was just so anxious. Like I would just, we would play this show and it was incredible. And then I'd lay on the bus after, like just couldn't sleep because my mind was spinning so much. Cause it was like, man, after this, like we're on tour support. I don't know. We're going to have to go back to the van. And then my band guys are going to be frustrated by that. And like, I want to get these guys raises, but like the song, like the song died at, you know, like all those things that you're trying to carry. And that's where, when you talk about it's so hard as a, as an artist to like try to take those risks because every risk you take affects other people Mm -hmm. because if you know what i mean like versus you could just keep writing the same thing that's been working and try to shoot for radio because if you get that radio success you can at least it's going to grow for another year Mm -hmm. um then you can keep paying these guys for another year but like all of that stuff's where it gets really stressful and that's what can take away from the art really easily because it's not about you anymore it's not about Mm -hmm. me anymore you know this isn't about um you know this isn't my story anymore, which is the cool part, but also the the weight of it. Yeah, yeah it's one thing to let yourself down, but then when you're <laughs> letting sure. other people down, you, you, like your friends, and and you, know, you get a wife, and it's like that's when the stress creeps in. Yeah, but luckily things have been going pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been blessed, man. Yeah, I've I've, I've 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 had a story, man, that like at every moment there was just the right amount of momentum that mm-hmm. has just been able to fill the tank, you know whether it was I hate Alabama at the beginning or Creek Will Rise at 
finally got the top 10 or yeah. uh, this song on the Twister soundtrack. Like at every, at every moment, like the Lord has opened the perfect door and, and, and been able to, you know, keep the bus and keep the van, keep the gas in the bus mm-hmm. and, and play these shows, more opportunities. But, um, you know, a song Faith from a Farmer that you guys got to hear that yeah. come You're on this. Been th- teasing on socials yeah, too. Yeah, com- coming on this record, it's like, honestly, I wrote that song about, you know, what it felt like to be an artist a lot of the time, you know, where it's like, you can work as hard as you want to, you can write as many songs as you want to, you can play as many shows and like grind it. But at the end of the day, it's not in your control and it's not in your hands. And like, we kind of just have to plant the seeds and hope that they grow and hope the Lord, you know, brings the sun and brings the water and, and just kind of live in that constant, con- constant state of, of, of faith. And uh, I think that's a, for a lot of people's job, it, it's like that. But, you know, I kind of wrote that as an analogy to what it kind of means to be a, to be an artist. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's such a terrifying and exciting career path, if you could even call it that, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like a hobby that you just try to make money off of sometimes. It feels that way. <laughs> but it's, um, I mean, now it's like, you know, with my job, it's like pretty blue chip touring yeah. gig, I would say. <laughs> I would, but, say, uh, yeah, I would say, well. <laughs> but I remember like you know in the early days, it's like trying to string stuff together, you oh, know, yeah. and it's like it does affect your sleep, man. When you don't know, it's like how long is this gonna last? It's like okay, I have a couple shifts on Broadway, and I have this teaching gig, and I have this lined up, this writer's round, I'm getting paid a hundred dollars to do, and okay, I'm cool for a bit, and then it's like, but you don't know what's next, and it's like, yeah, ooh, anxiety inducing, you know, yeah. I mean, a million percent and, and, you know, and, and that's where it's like, it's about, it's it's about believing in something and, and for band guys and for crew guys Mm -hmm. to go like, Hey, I'm making 300 bucks a show right now, Yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. which is like, we're, we're making ends meet at that point. If I put enough shows on the books, Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, man, but if you can believe in the artists and in the person and in the songs and believe that hey man I, I see where this is going i believe that we can headline arenas one day and we can all i can put everybody on salary like that's the, that's the biggest dream right mm-hmm. and so for the for the band guys that I, I tell my band guys a lot of just like hey man trust me and and believe in this and my my greatest desire here is to like to where everyone here can have six kids you know and and build a <laughs> life of their <laughs> dreams and like yeah and and be able to afford that and be able to you know like i mean dude the idea of coming from south florida to go like i love music i love playing the guitar i think i'm great at it but like how to make a living off that that's just a lot of right place right time right open doors a lot of favor from the lord right and then you know here you are you know on the biggest country touring gig in country music you know and now you get to have a little peace in that but that's a long journey to get there yeah Yeah. and i'm not 24 not not (laughs) even close to 24 i'm 37 so it's not it wasn't something that just no, it popped up. You yeah. Know? yeah. Well, man, and that's, honestly, that story is relatable because, like, you related it to the life of a farmer, right? Me, as a business owner. 100%. Same thing, dude. Exact yeah. same thing. Yes. It's, so that's why it's relatable. 100%. Because I have, I'm in the music world, but even if I wasn't, if my my company was being a plumber, you know? 100%. And it's going out on your own of being a plumber and then it's having employees that you're in charge of making sure they have enough work. hundred percent. You know, it's that thing of taking the leap and believing in yourself is always there. And you always have to make a conscious decision on, Hey, what am I doing? Who's it affecting? Right. 100%. I mean, there's that line in that verse, the uh, first verse that says his family's on that farm since his daddy was born, but he knows that it only takes one storm. And it's like, man, as you're, if you're, believing in something if you're living for a dream and whether that's your family or for me my family of guys on the road and whatever Mm -hmm. it's like man you're carrying that weight and uh yeah that song's so special to me because i think it just relates to a lot of people and um, we've gotten to play it at some shows acoustic we're going out on the luke bryan farm tour this weekend and i cannot wait to play that there um but every time people will come up after with tears in their eyes and go man like let me tell you what that song meant to me and that is the coolest emotion as a songwriter of all time. But I've always found the more specific you get with the song, the more relatable it is in an interesting yeah. way. And that's one of those where it's like, 
that song is so specific to like a group of people, farmers in America, but it's also so relatable to you as a business owner, starting Raise Rowdy, starting this podcast to me as a songwriter, like everybody can relate to that in a certain way. And, and that's what I love about country music. Yeah. That is the thing that makes it so powerful is, and we hear that. That's one of the cool things about getting to do this podcast as often as we do, is we get to hear things that speak. Yeah. And that's one of the things that speaks is the more you put into it, the more emotion and the more of you you put into it, the more relatable it is to everyone. And that's the key to the genre. Yeah, it really is. That's why authenticity matters, right? If yeah. you can like, if you can, you know, let people in on what you're going through, mm -hmm. then they see, they hear what they're going through. Yeah. And that's, that's what, that's why music is like so important. That's why being an artist is such a beautiful like gift you're given. And, and being a musician in general is that you get to, you know, be the soundtrack for someone's emotions. You know, you get yeah. to be, I got, dude, it's one of the coolest things. Um, I was in rehearsals last week and, uh, Jake, my, my manager, showed up with this package. He goes, hey, man, this is pretty cool. And I open it up, and it's an American flag with this letter. And it's this uh, stationed Air Force, um, Air Force guy in the Air Force um, who is in, like, Kuwait or something. And he flew this American flag in mission over, like, a, like a special ops mission. And he like did it in my honor. And he wrote me this whole letter of just saying like, hey man, I, I just want to tell you how much your music means to me, what it means to my family, and like specific songs that like when he's gone, it reminds him of his family, that my songs are like centerpiece to like make him feel like when he's homesick. And so he flew this American flag and this special ops mission like in my honor and, and sent it to me. Like, dude, that's so much better than like me worrying about if my TikTok is going to mm -hmm. go viral or yeah. if, I, if my you know song is going to get five million streams a week one. Like, mm -hmm. and I I, I got to constantly remind myself every morning of that perspective. But like, that's the coolest stuff all, ever. That guy really hates Alabama. <laughs> Big, yeah, <laughs> hates him. He hates them, dude. No, it's but man, that's <laughs> what everybody's doing everything for. Whether it's finding your person and getting married, right? And or whether it's having that song that means something and puts chills on the back of some yeah. person that needs it neck, you know, like it's that's what makes music so powerful. And that is why songs are timeless and it they break language barriers. Yeah, 100%. It's it's sheer emotion um, mixed with something that, you know, through time has brought people together. What is this special? Is what's special about country music in general? Because I heard a quote, and it's kind of been an anchor quote for me in this new EP. And, and a guy said, he said, uh, the first question any child asks when all of his needs are met is, "Tell me a story." And if you think about just the power of story, and the power that it, it, it story is what the world revolves around. We're all one story, and we're all you know living inside of a story. And then there's a bigger story of the world, and you just kind of go, you can go in depth in that, but, but it is, and that's the power of country music is that country music is story and there's nothing that connects more, that relates more, that makes people feel more than a story. And, um, and so that's what I love about country music. That's what drew me to country music. That's what made me start writing songs at six, seven years old was the power to say more in three and a half minutes of a country song that could change someone's life. And you could even say in a conversation, think about songs like The Good Stuff, Kenny Chesney, or mm -hmm. There Goes My Life, or Live Like You Were Dying, or Three Wooden Crosses, like Steel and Cinderella. Like these, like that song can make, like literally change the way you're looking at the world mm -hmm. in three and a half minutes. And like, if you can capture that as a songwriter, that is like, that's worth a lifetime. Yeah. And those are the songs that'll live forever. 100%. You know? And that's, I think that's one of the other things we hear is everybody's steering for something that lives forever, right? Whether that's having seven kids that you can afford because <laughs> you have a great gig or it's having a song that is considered timeless, that thing of, live, we all know that there's an expiration date on this thing we're doing, yeah, which is called life, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But the good that you can create and the masterful moments, whether that's a 
beautiful baby boy or girl, you know, yeah. <laughs> or whether that's a song that touches so many souls, that's really what you're pushing for. Yeah, it's about legacy, you know. It's yeah, about, it's about finding purpose, and I think that we're able in our jobs to, you know, find purpose pretty easily because we get to impact people, we get to speak into people, we get to, you know, whether it's for an hour and a half, just let them not care about anything in the world other than drinking a beer and listening to a country song. Yeah, or it's in the moments after because. I think anytime you're given a certain platform, you know, I always make the joke that it's wild, you know, what happens in people's brain when they watch you on stage for an hour on an elevated surface with a microphone, like they just perceive you in a different way. Yeah. Um, which just gives more power to your words, which gives you more of an opportunity to speak into someone and really impact someone. And I remember as a young kid, you know, I was around country music a little bit and I got to meet a lot of guys and meet a lot of songwriters. And I remember the impact their words would have on me. And so I try to be intentional about that and um, w when I can at least. Yeah. It's important, man, because there's plenty of people that are looking up to you to figure out what you did or what you were trying to do and what you were doing, just like you were looking up to Eric Church. 100%, you know? which is just a, a weird... Because I always... I, I, I think for me, the one thing I learned pretty quickly is I always thought that, that you would kind of feel that more, but you don't. I'm sure you feel the same way. Like, if you think about uh, a guitar player, utility guys, you mm -hmm. would call yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, if you think about the gig you're on now, right, as like literally the biggest gig in country music, if you would have thought about him when you were 24 and your perception of that guy, if that guy were to sit down with you and have a coffee with you and, and speak life into you, like those words would have carried so much weight. And now you are that guy in that certain position. But you don't you don't necessarily feel that all the time. You kind of feel like the same guy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Which which is right. Like, I think that's probably how you should feel. I don't to stay humble, but. You also kind of have to be cognitive of that to recognize, oh, my, my words have a certain weight and I have a certain ability to impact people. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Man, when we had Cappy on the pod, just listening to that man speak, <laughs> For sure. honestly, a just lot of nuggets that, in that. Episode. He, he oh, gave us so them. much wisdom in yeah. the hour and a half that we got with him, you know, that I was like. Man, I was jealous that Kurt gets to hang out with him yeah, more, you know. For sure. But it's it's that same thing with artists. Yeah. You know, you hear such insight that you just break through the barrier of the stuff that you're currently thinking about, which is the best part about conversations, is when you get something from someone else you're having a conversation with that feeds your life 100%. and helps you think about things in a different way. Yeah, and when people are like okay with himself enough to be forthcoming with information. Yeah. You know, like I'm sure Church gave Luke plenty of information, and when we were you know, after the show in Maine, I saw you, and we are all smoking cigars, drinking beers, whatever. I'm sure he gave you some advice, too, you know? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the, the band stuff I talked about. Like, yeah. I'll always remember that in, in his stories mm -hmm. and then the advice. Like, I will carry that for the rest of my career. Yeah. Because Luke Combs' words carry weight to me, mm -hmm. you know, because I see him in a position that I would dream to be, you know? And I think that's really cool. And yeah, Cappy's a great example. You know, we we just got to sign with, with Cappy, um, I don't know, two, three months ago and mm -hmm. got to start working with him. And he's just an amazing dude and somebody I really trust and respect. But um, he has a way of encouraging people. He has a way of lifting up people. He has a way of believing in, in people's dreams, no matter what. Um, and I think that that's a, a really special thing. Yeah, I agree with that, man. And he surrounds himself with other people that are like that. That's the one thing that you see culture is important. You're talking yeah. about band culture, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a record label, a management company, a publishing house, yeah. a, a group of plumbers, you know, like anything like their culture is so important to what you're building. It's everything. And, and that's what makes it work or not. A hundred percent. You know, and, and, and culture is only uh, culture. Like, honestly, you know, I don't know how to phrase this, but but culture can can really kind of uh, expose or uh, personify the leader's personality. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what y'all's camp is. Is your culture is a personification of who Luke Combs is, and if you do it the right way, that's incredible. Cappy, Make Wake, and 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 his business is a personification of who Cappy is, which is a really humble dude who looks to lift up others, and so. Um, you know, I, th I think leadership can expose you easily and it also can kind of solidify the, the type of person you're trying to be. Yeah. And it's hard, man, especially if things aren't working. If, if the For world sure. isn't exactly. all sunshine exactly. and rainbows, yeah. For sure. you know, that's the hard part. And it's figuring out how you can express things to people in a positive way. Yeah. Right. And the greatest leaders 
use their other friends to help them figure out how to do that. They don't think they know everything. They understand that the resources they have will help them be a better version of them too. Well, I mean, the greatest leaders are the greatest, you know, servers, right? Like like, to be a leader is to serve people. Mm -hmm. And I think about that a lot with my job where it's like, yeah, we're on the road Thursday to Saturday and we can come home and my band guys can, you know, hang out and chill and maybe catch a gig here and there. But like I come home and I have from, you know, Monday to Wednesday, I have to run the business and figure out how are we going to grow this thing. And so I, in that, I'm trying to serve them, right? I'm trying to serve this business and this dream that we're all on. And, um, and I think, you know, for anything, I think Cab is a great example. Go back to him. It's like he's a, he's great at serving others, and yeah. that makes him a great leader. Absolutely. How did you all get uh, hooked up? Jake. Yeah, there's a funny. There's <laughs> actually a funny story uh, that I haven't shared. I think I'm able to share it. Uh, but we'll, If not, we'll cut it out. Yeah, we'll yeah. find out. <laughs> But it was like the worst night of my career. Okay, oh. uh, this was uh, back. This was you know a year and some change ago. Probably, um, probably twenty twenty three. I'd say February twenty twenty three. And uh, I got an opportunity to open up for Flatland Calvary. And uh, it was in uh, College Station, Texas, at Hurricane Harry's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, been there with them for sure. And like once again, I'm a massive Flatland Calvary fan. Like, like this is like my favorite band, and uh, and so I was super fired up. And, and we show up to the show, and I'll try to make a long story short here, but I've got time. <laughs> yeah, the the show it was the worst. It was like this, no pun intended, hurricane of just like awful, awful. Everything went wrong, and um, there were a lot of mistakes that were made on uh, some people in in my crew unknowingly to me based on when we started the set and then we went over and then uh, and preface like when you're opening up for a band you are it's like you are walking into their mother's house yeah like if your friend invites you over and like you you show up like if if she asks you to take off the shoes the door take off the shoes you're not going to go in the pantry without asking her first like all of those rules apply right and um and so we just uh, there was a level of arrogance in my crew and with the guys that like i think we had been headlining for the first time and we came in and we just didn't we didn't act right and my then girlfriend had actually flown out and surprised me and so i was (laughs) me and her were hanging out and so i was just not aware of anything that was happening we went on late we went over there were you know complaints from the flatland guys naturally of just like hey you guys we, you have a set time and whatever and so then at, they're like they weren't they weren't uh we didn't apply to them once again i didn't i didn't know anything until the next morning and then like after the show i after we played i left because like i said leah my, my now wife she was in town and we did long distance so we went out to dinner and, and just hung out and when i when i left like just chaos ensued with my band and like some guys like threw beer bottles against the venue wall. like just craziness Whoa. yeah just craziness i had no idea and so i wake up the next morning to a full 911 right to where it was like everything was burning down yeah and you're just like trying to get through it and i'm just like what what are we talking about like i, I was so confused you know i was just so confused and this list of events that had taken place it was like I mean, it painted me to be like the most conceited, worst person ever. And, um, and so either way, so Cappy is their manager and, and he, he call And so like, he's like, and as you know, anything you do on the road, it's as if Luke Combs does it right. Like if you, Absolutely. if you treat, 100%. if you treat someone a certain yep. way, it's not, you know, Kurt did this. Mm-hmm. It's Luke Combs crew. They're in it's Luke Combs. Yep. So all these things happened that when I was gone, and it was just really embarrassing. Like it was just a really and I, and um, it was like it was just like a really tough morning because I was just like holy crap. But like I woke up to a call of just like you know Cappy hates you, Flatland never gonna let oh you show. We God. got banned from the venue, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, it's gone now, so yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's no it's harm, no foul. <laughs> <laughs> um, but either way, so that was my introduction to Cappy. Wow. Was, okay. Was that and to Flatland, right? Was that that phone call to go, man? I am so deeply sorry. I am so embarrassed, and like that is not who I am or the type of culture I want to set. We like fired everybody that day. Like it was one of those situations. Like got a whole new crew wow. and band. 
Um, Cappy's like, you fucked up so bad. I want to take a percentage of your earnings. <laughs> <laughs> but but I tell that story because like it literally was the worst day of, of my career for me, mm-hmm. uh, just because it was super embarrassing to me. Mm-hmm. And um, and I apologize to Flatland individually, like called Cleta, like all of the things. Um, but then I tell that story because there's such a cool redemptive arc that a year later. Um, I end up getting to, we ended up making some changes, uh, just kind of on the business side of things. And, uh, and Jake, who was my tour manager, one of my best buddies since we were like 15, 16, 17, Jake. like he's just a grinder. And he was my tour manager at the time and, and him and I were just dreaming together, man. And I just, I love him so much. And I was just like, man, this, is the, this is the guy I want to do this with. I want to stand at Red Rocks with. And so I ended up making some changes on the management side and all respect to everybody before, but uh, ended up making some changes and, and Jake and Jake stepping in and uh, we got to meet with Cappy on that side of things ago and I got to for the first time sit across from the table with him kind of showing my heart to show my vision and uh, was just immediately when I connected with him I was just like this is the guy you know he just everything he carries is exactly what I want to as an artist and uh, so I got to meet him and then dream with him and, and we started working and then the first project that I'm putting out under with Cappy as my manager is this project I wrote with Cleto from Flatland Calvary. Yeah. And it's, I, I laugh at that cause it's just this full circle kind of God story. And the other thing is, is that when we fired everybody, I called Jake who was in sophomore in college. And I was like, dude, I have like two months left of this tour. Will you just come and get me through this? And like, just kind of like, please save me. And he came in and then like, that was where him and I really connected. And then he just what like never you. left. And uh, so it's just kind of this full circle, kind of how weird, how God works, because like in that, it definitely taught me a lot of what it meant to be a leader and like what it meant to like have a good crew of guys around me. And then the full circle a year later, I'm now working with Cappy. I'm now uh, we've got the song with Cleto on the record, yeah. Flatland, but become buddies with those guys. And they're like the most incredible dudes ever. Um, and so that my introduction was awful and then we kind of redeemed it at the end and, and so now getting to work with him has been really fun but I just love that story because it, it shows that even in the, the midst of kind of my worst day as an artist it was kind of it was starting the story of kind of re, of a redemptive arc uh, that's totally the thing too it's that's not about story. yeah it's not about what happens it's about what you do with sure. the results of what happened well and, and, and Gabby even in the moment where like obviously how that at how you, how you first hear that story as a manager, I would have lost my mind. I, if I was managing Flatland, I would have been so mad. Um, but I responded and I, I, I just said, hey man, I'm so deeply sorry. Like this all falls on me. Uh, thankfully I wasn't there, so it kind of saved me from a lot of the mess, right? Um, but then, I mean, I did, I made a lot, I made ch- all the changes to my crew. Fired, you know, a, a bunch of guys just cause it wasn't the right, you know, culture. And that fell on me at the end of the day, but he fully respected how I handled it. Cleto fully respected how I handled it and accepted, very graciously accepted my apology. Um, and then, uh, so it's just really cool to kind of see that we get to all work together now and, and, and become friends. Yeah, that's amazing. And honestly, it takes it takes something to say you're sorry and yeah. to be willing to make changes, right? Yeah, I mean, in that case, there was no other, you yeah, know, no other response other right. than like. But it still yeah. does. Yeah. There's still a lot of people. Well, that you could have kept the same crew. Yeah. And yeah. said, ah, fuck it, whatever, and then just went around, for sure. You know. Yeah. No, so. there, uh, th- because there was an action there. I think that you know, Cappy was able to accept the apology and and you know respect how I handled it. Um, and but country and music too, it's like shit like that doesn't fly. You know, no. people talk and it's no. like. It's a small town yeah. in a big city. Well, and that's where it was like, I mean, it was very stressful on me because it was just like, man, that's not what I would have been known as. It's not what I want my crew to be known as. Like that, it was very just like kind of cocky how everything was handled and like that. Like I, I really affects me. Uh, but, um, and then, but in that too, Jake and Jake and Jake had been mentoring Cappy since Jake was 15, you know, because Jake's sister worked with, worked yeah. with Cappy for a long time. And so uh, Cappy had been mentoring Jake for forever. And so it was really cool that we kind of all get to form this together and, yeah. and start this journey. It's super cool. He's such a great guy. Cappy and Jake both. Yes. Yeah. I was talking about Jake, but yeah, Cappy's pretty good too. Yeah. You, you and you and Jake had a fun, a fun little hang after the show. Oh yeah, man. Of course. I love drinking some beers. I, Chugging some beers. <laughs> <laughs> I met Jake um helping with the blue otter oh, cool. tourney. Yeah, we're um, about to he texted me this morning about playing in that. Uh, yeah. Are you gonna be there? We'll be out there, yeah. Heck we yeah. have a whole 
think Crown Heads is going to. Really? Yeah. Mm. yeah if you, I need if to you're come free, in. maybe come chain smoke with us. Yeah. I'm down. <laughs> I think Matt smoked six cigars during that day. And I was like, bro, maybe just like yeah, three. Maybe just chill. Yeah. <laughs> maybe like <laughs> three of six them. Six cigars. I would die. <laughs> uh, Kurt, yeah. Kurt, Kurt gave uh, us my whole band cigars after the yeah. show in Maine. Yeah. That was fun, man. We don't, you know, I think that was a little bit of a different show for you guys, too. Yeah, because it was a makeup show from yeah. years ago. Yeah, you know, because y'all are doing all these stadiums, so it was probably cool to kind of yeah get back in that environment. And everybody had a really fun night. Of just I don't know, it felt like it felt like the old days for me, just to kind of get to just really hang, enjoy a show, and, and have a good time after. The weather was insane. It was so nice it out. Was perfect. Yeah, yeah it's great. I'm happy right now. This Nashville season that we're in right now oh, it's best. is mint. Kurt was talking about that yesterday, smoking cigars, and I'm just sitting outside at the like on the phone, but like outside, <laughs> sitting on the phone, and got to hang with a buddy. Those moments when the weather is exactly right just kind of fix your soul a little bit too. Oh, uh, we got to. I'm super blessed, but uh, right when we got married, my wife and I bought a house, and um, like I had like. She had her things she wanted in a house, and I, I like, kind of jokingly, because I didn't think this was possible, you know, in the Nashville market, but I was like, I want an indoor fireplace. Like, I want a full wood burning, like, in our living room fireplace, and, like, we found this house. It checked every, the first house we looked at, checked every box, and, like, brand new build, too, which was wild for it to have a wood burning fireplace <laughs> in the living room, but we bought it. We moved in in April, and so I haven't gotten to, like, build a fire in it yet. But like how excited I am to watch an October football game, Sunday mm-hmm. night football game, and build a fire in my living room. Mm-hmm. Like that's all Sounds I'm premium, thinking man. about. Yeah. yeah. I actually uh, my house has a fireplace and I bought it and that it wasn't in working order. And I ended up listening to this is the most correct thing ever, but a podcast on fireplaces. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, stuff you should know. It's like one of my favorite podcasts. It's great. What? Uh, it's this. What did kind you of, learn? Uh, well, basically, is that a fireplace is not really a good way to heat your home, no. like energy wise. And but I was like, well, I don't care. But like a, a black little stove thing, right? That would be better. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. And um, but so I ended up listening to this podcast, and it was like all these reasons not to get a wood burning fireplace and i'm sorry to rain on your parade here but i mean you you, you don't do it for the warmth i'm not no. here for right the warmth, yeah brother. yeah but here i've got a, i've got heat and ac i'm that'll yeah. that'll cover it but I'm mine was it was an old i have an old house it's like from the 30s and um but it was a coal burning fireplace they would burn coal in it and now like the chimney it was like 12 grand or something to get it fixed and then i, I was like eh, I you know i can't do that it's a lot and then now i was like well let me go and check in on that and then it was like they were like, don't get a wood one. And so now I have like a clicker. I, I will say, though, Dude. that it is, it, you think <laughs> you think it's like really shitty, but it's like when you just want to just watch TV for an hour and you don't want to like worry yeah, about yeah, building sure. it and you just pop it on, it is pretty nice. Yeah. No, I mean, 100%. But there's something about Oh yeah, being a man and, wake, and waking 100%. up on a cold day. And pouring a cup of co- black cup of coffee, and then slowly just kindling that fire. You need to move to Maine. I know. <laughs> I know. We were just up in Montana last week, and like I, you know, we we went and stayed with some friends, and I just I was like, hey, I want you to know the main reason I'm here is to build a fire. <laughs> um, and so yeah, it's just that's it's like a, some ooga booga caveman shit, dude. Yeah, it feels sure. good. It's just something yeah. in there. Yeah. That's primal. Does it. It's primal. Yeah. It is. It's funny though because Kurt loves fires. Like if I want to talk, like outside yeah. in the fire pit, if I want to talk Kurt into something, I say we're gonna have a fire and we're gonna smoke cigars. And he's like, I mean, okay, you're talking <laughs> my language now. What, yeah, what is? I mean, there's something that like fires elicit just like better conversations. Yeah. I mean, I wrote this whole EP with the thought of songs that I could sing around a fire. Okay. Yeah. yeah, like these are all songs that like I could sit around a fire with my buddies and they would all. They would all be like, they would fit. They would fit the aesthetic. Yeah, it, I think that's a tale as old as time, right? Is yeah. collecting, stuff, yeah, dude. collecting people yeah. together. And I was talking about this. I was slightly baked last night, but I was <laughs> I was talking with my buddy who's going through some stuff. He got he's a he got let go from a gig that he really uh, loved, dang. right? Mm-hmm. But it wasn't like he wasn't good enough. It was just when record said, label went uh, away. Money's oh. not there to take care of stuff. Like that's how it works. Sure. But I was like, man, 
it, back in the day, there was a dude banging three rocks together, yep. and that was music. And then someone figured out that if you put this wooden thing with some strings from the guts of a deer, that then that's music. But you're constantly setting that standard of, oh, I listen to this thing that I love, right? It starts with noise, and then it turns into a bard going around to all of these different places and playing songs. You didn't know if that bard's good. He was the only dude you ever heard play songs. For sure. You know? But now we have the ability to steer towards exactly the things that make our heart full with music. Yeah. Right? We're at a crazy time in that. You know, whereas 200 years ago, it was just the dude in your town that knew how to do it. Right? Sure. So we are so blessed that we are at a time where you can find the things that make your heart full 100%. in the musical world. And while it's harder to get 10 buddies around a fire now, yeah, especially in your thirties. <laughs> yeah. Physically. Right. Sure. Uh, it is, it is so easy and so available to find those songs that you wrote thinking about that and being able to get to experience them. Yeah. You know, I mean the first song that the storyteller called the storyteller yeah. is, uh, first line is uh from the start of time first man to start a fire wonder about the stars any man to lose a fire from a hard ride when the whiskey went too far every cowboy on the text plane i was told blew out hard away it was a long ride spinning until it too and that's a storyteller you know it's like that's what that song is about it's about that primal just like the story has always been it will always be it has evolved it started with a fire and now story is on spotify and in front of you know sixty thousand people for kurt every night right <laughs> like like it's just we're all storytellers man it is and telling a story is a is a service that you give to other people right yeah. just yeah. to kind of bring us back to the beginning of the pod but it's like what a great thing to be able to give to people yeah that's why i love reading it's like story time yeah you're, you're a reader yeah i love reading yeah what's your like what's your go-to's well, uh, my favorite is science fiction. Okay. Like, I love like sci-fi stuff. So I just finished uh, Dream Park by Larry Niven, which is like, I mean, it's like really cheesy, like 80s sci-fi. I like reading older sci-fi because it's fun to see like what their vision of the future is like. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's interesting. It's like not, it's like they have the craziest technology, but they still have to like take photos with film you know <laughs> or if like you watch 2001 a space odyssey there's like pay phones in it yeah. you know it's like that's funny. But anyway i like sci-fi is my favorite that's funny it's i mean stories are the thing i mean think about jesus think about the bu books of the bible yeah. those are the stories that have crafted so many lives and the direction and the goodness and sometimes badness in so many people, right? Well, I mean, the Bible is the first story, and it is the, you know, I think Jordan Peterson talks about this, where the Bible is like, is the basis of all stories, because mm -hmm. that was the first story that was massively produced. And so all stories are from that, the, the tree of that story, which is a wild thing, you know, all, uh, all basis of morality, you know, yeah. and story is from, from the Bible. And, and, you know, that's the beauty of Christianity and Jesus is that like, Jesus spoke in story. Mm -hmm. Like if you go read what he was talking about, every sermon he spoke and every lesson he was trying to teach, he did through story and through the parables. And uh, that's what I love. I mean, I, I have a dream down the road to do like a parables record to mm -hmm. where like, and that's what faith from a farmer is. Faith from a farmer is based off a parable. Jesus spoke of, of the farmer and, uh, but just writing songs that are like country songs, but like are really tied back to scripture. Like that's one of my, my yeah. big dreams. Cause I just think that, uh, you know, like you said, story and, and just the power of it is like, that is, that's the, that's the whole kind of point of life, right? It's like impact people through story. Yeah, it, it is. And that's music is as much as it is books and it's conversations as much as it is anything. I mean, there's been so many times where someone had brought up something they heard in one of our podcasts and I'm like, so you're one of the 250 people <laughs> that listened to that episode? <laughs> You know, <laughs> I was actually just thinking that. Yeah, it's like because we're all telling stories here about yeah. you know us at a show or you know us at a fire or whatever. So we're doing our storytelling duty also. That's what a service, podcast hopefully. is. Like yeah, that's, that's the entire reason y'all started this. Absolutely. You know, and and to promote new records and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, that's part of it too. Yeah. It's it's about celebrating the the good, right? Yeah. And talking about the future that is good too. 
you know? Well, celebrating the hu- probably the humanity yeah. of this genre, I think, yeah. is probably what y'all are doing in a really cool way. And the cool part for us, as people that get to do this and have now, we're probably 100 episodes in with me, yeah. right? We're almost 200 total, uh, is you get to hear the things from each person that are different, mm. but the thing you really realize is the things that make the people the same are yeah. really the the bulk of it you know yeah, and it's 100%. just how someone expresses that sameness you know also well yeah it's funny how that works yeah it's like being true to yourself is what makes you unique but everyone is true to themselves they all do the same thing but it makes them unique it's yeah funny how that works for sure the more you talk about a song being personal yeah the more someone connects to it yeah doesn't matter if the girl in the song has blue hair or brown hair. They pass over that, right? Oh, they hear the emotion that you're putting out and the way you sing it. Yeah, we were in uh we played a show in Sweden and it was uh That's sick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like it was like a, a guitar pool style thing that we did. And um I was sitting next to Lauren Watkins. Um, Great by the way. Who I love. Yep. She's just fellow the best. podcast alumni. Yep. <laughs> yeah, she's the best. But um I was sitting next to her and we were playing a show in Sweden and uh, this guy yells out, uh, like, I'm about to play a song. This guy just yells out, I hate Obama. And she leans over to me and she's like, did he just say, I hate Obama? Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was like, I was like, I was like, no, he wants, I hate Alabama. Uh-oh. Um, you, you know? And, <laughs> and uh oh and I, man it's it's funny but i i just i just laugh at that story because i'm like dude i put out that song literally thinking nobody outside of tennessee would care mm. you know like that song was just so for tennessee fans mm. only and if the biggest that song ever got was one of my buddies heard it at a tailgate once mm-hmm. then i was happy and then that song like changed my life and career and then I'm playing in Sweden <laughs> and someone yells that out because in some way, not even knowing where Alabama is probably doesn't even know that there are four downs in football and how much is a touchdown, but that's all connected to them in some way, whether it was the melody or the words or the emotion. And it's like, that is so cool. Like that is wild. And it's like such a specific thing could, could go that far. Yeah. It's, it's a great story. It's crazy. And, uh, we talk about I talk about sports. I was a crazy big sports fan. I played football in high school. I was bad, but you know we played. Sure. <laughs> and uh, I lived so much of my life like chasing, watching my sports teams, right? Um, but as I got older, I got more into music because, and I I literally saw a video a comedian post last night. I watched that, and I, I've said this so many times that I was like, that. But that guy didn't steal it from me. He doesn't know who I am. He had the same emotion. It's like when you go to a concert, you always leave and had a good time. Mm, you know, that's funny. like you are always leaving that concert and your Fired heart's up. full. Yeah. Uh, you know, or you had a, a good time with your friends. Football. I was a pit football season ticket holder and pit. That's your first problem there. <laughs> well, but that's my, where I yeah. went to school, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, uh, they lose 50, half the time. 50, 50. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're going to a game. And you're going to have half the time you're slightly upset at least, at minimum, about a loss, right? Even though you just had all this great time with your friends. And you could be distraught, too. Like, you could be truly Yeah, they could mess up your week. Yeah. Like, the Steelers are the biggest in Pittsburgh. The culture of the city changes on a Monday after a Steelers loss on a Sunday. 100%. And that's how SEC football is down here, right? So, and it's crazy, too, because, like, in Pittsburgh, it's Steelers. Yeah. Well, in Nashville, it's Bulldogs, it's Tennessee, it's because it's such a melting pot, yeah. you know. Well, co- I mean, college football, NFL football, it's like a it's like a real life game of risk, mm-hmm. you know, like the board game risk, yeah. where like you're literally just you've got all these teams that are like at war with each other, and then one team wins, which is advances, you know, like, and that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of sports. I mean, I mean, m- most half of the memories I could my best memories with my dad are through Cardinals baseball or Tennessee football you know which is the beauty of it but you're right like there's nothing like music that connects people yeah to that degree now there's hate too there's people that are like I don't like this and food yeah food (laughs) food's good Pamani's sandwiches yeah (laughs) as long as they're not in the morning you know yeah Yeah. (laughs) sure 
garlic pizza. No, but <laughs> that's a that's the thing that for me has made music never leave. Yeah, is when I was six years old and my brother Steve had me in the back of his Volkswagen Scirocco and was playing metal music to me too loud and asking me who the band was. Right. Yeah. To my brother that was two years older than me showing me who Pearl Jam was and yeah. what Nirvana was to the first time I went to a country show and I got to see all of these people that I knew having the best nights of their lives and a lot of people that I didn't know yeah, having yeah. the best nights of their lives. 100%. That's the thing that makes people people yeah. and you get to be a beacon for that. Yeah. You know? And I, th- I, th- I mean, I, th- and I think that's also, it just kind of made me think of like, that's also probably, I don't, I would love to know your thoughts, but as an artist, for sure, like one of the hardest parts about being an artist is it can really easily strip your love for music away. Mm. Um, because for me as a massive country music fan, like it was like, dude, we would freaking get the, uh, you know, the year pass at the hall of fame, you know, mm-hmm. being in Nashville. And I just, I loved, love country music with all my heart. Um, but now I'm an artist and so the whole thing's different, you know, yeah. and it's hard for me to like become a fan of a new artist or like listen to the country radio without thinking about myself or thinking about my music or thinking about, you know, the, the genre or, th- or thinking about work at the end of the day. And it's like, that is, that's one of the hardest things for me about being an artist is like, and trying to like fight to like maintain the just first love aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and was part of this EP, man, was part of just like, I'm going to write songs that I don't give a dang what anybody thinks about other than me and maybe my wife, you know, yeah. if she likes them, we're good. But, uh, <laughs> but it's like, uh, it, it's, it, it takes a lot of, you know, and I don't think a lot of artists will admit that, but the reality is that it takes, it, it takes a lot of work to like maintain your love of country music as a fan. Yeah. In the same way, I'm sure like an NFL player, you know, probably has to, it can't be a fan of the NFL anymore but mm-hmm. um but trying to regain that has been been a thing for me man i've struggled with that too bro everyone all artists i feel like at least some degree feel that way mm-hmm. yeah it's for me i talk to matt about this and i say hey matt we have to go to shows as fans yeah not cuz someone asked us to come and they gave us tickets we need to just go enjoy music. Yeah. Because you know, that's why we started this thing. Weezer's playing in town tonight, I think. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a fun one to go to. Yeah, I looked at the tickets. Uh, they were expensive. Oh, Bridgestone? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Where are they at? Uh, Bridgestone. Bridgestone. We yeah. pour out here, so. No, yeah. I looked. I think they were like 175 for like decent tickets, and I was like, man, I love Weezer, but. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, also, the other hard part for Luke, me is. Luke Combs would never, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other hard part for me is, is we have so many events. Yeah. So we are hosting 10 times a month in town. So half those shows are in that time that we have those 10 shows. Oh yeah. You know? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm like, if I go to a concert, I want the show to be like five songs long. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, You're like, like, all right, I'm going to go, go to, yeah, I go to a show and it's like, I want to see them. But like, also like I have to, I'm at concerts every, like three, four nights a week. Mm. Um, and it's just, it becomes such a job, but, uh, so I'm like, I'll, I'll be at a show and I'll like, I'll love somebody and then it'll be like, all right, I've got six songs. And like, that, that was great for me. You know, mm-hmm. ready to go get in bed. When's the last show we went to? I guess we went and saw Dan and Shay. That was fun. We had a good time yeah. with that. I, uh, oh, I'm flatland in Colby. Oh yeah. We drove, we just went on a road trip, the two of us oh, sick. to yeah. a Georgia theater. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, it's but good, it's a good place to see Flatland, man. Yeah. yeah, dude, it sounds so good in that room too. Oh, I love George. Um, I had a moment while we were up and we went and did like a writers retreat that had some like shows around it, and uh, one of the performers looked at me as I was running beers to stage right for the for the crew. <laughs> you know, I'm literally like bar backing, you know, <laughs> for the squad that we yeah. brought up there, and. I must have had like the biggest shit eating grin on my face, you know? And she was like, man, just getting to see you do what you do for work and how much you enjoy it, like fed her soul. And I was like, damn, I need to make sure I never fucking lose that. Yeah. Cause that's why I started doing the thing. 100%. You know, I just love the music so much that I want to help. I want to be a part of it, you know? And that's what this thing means to so many people. 
Yeah, I mean, I I kind of said this earlier, but it was actually a song that I wrote that kind of started the right after I put on my first album. I, I kind of sat and we just bought my house and it was empty, you know. Um, and so I just would sit there and just kind of play guitar and I started writing alone again, which is what I'd done my entire life until getting a publishing deal. Yeah. And um, and I, I just started and I wrote this song called Nobody Listens and uh, and the chorus was like. So when a dream becomes a job, the job feels less like a dream. You start giving a lot more dams about what everybody thinks. But this morning I remembered the boy inside of me who play guitar or like who who would just sing these songs in the kitchen. So I wonder what would I sing if nobody listened. But that first line, when a dream becomes a job, job feels less like a dream. I think it's so true. But once again, not to, you know, keep kissing your butt, but like that was the difference about the Luke Combs camp is like y'all all were just having fun. Like, y'all all just kind of still had that first love to it. And I'm sure that some nights are better than others, and I probably caught y'all on a really great night. I don't know. But um, but, but I, I think that that was cool to see. And, uh, you know, even uh, Charles Russell Godden, he, he was saying the same thing. Like When, when y'all talked to him about y'all's crew, of it kind of reminded him that you can get to a certain level and still maintain that. Yeah. Um, and I think that was that was really cool for me to see. It's on the back of someone that makes it so that it is that way yeah yeah and then finding other people that will help you make it is that it is that way yeah you know i mean it's, it's in every little decision yeah it's well i hope that you uh get great treatment i know you will on the luke bryan tour yeah that's gonna be fun man. that's a good crew too, i've heard man. nothing yeah. but great things about them oh dude they're they're awesome we got to go on the road with them last uh, last summer and then uh but i've never done the farm tour which Y'all know yeah. the farm tour is going to be legit. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So I'm excited to see the Peach Pickers will be out there. Excited to hang out with those so guys. Uh, Tucker Wetmore, too. We got that song together. Yeah. So, so we'll get to play that. Bro, I remember the first time I heard that song was we um, we were playing at MetLife Stadium. And the, the Thursday, we play Friday, Saturday night, two nights. The Thursday before, we watched the Twisters movie in the stadium on the video wall. <laughs> And we had a food truck and an open bar, and they brought couches and, like, fake plants and stuff. And I sat with a cigar and watched <laughs> the movie, and I I played on the Bailey song that's on the yeah. thing. So I was listening to the music like crazy, hoping the Bailey song was on there, and but it didn't make the cut. But it's on the, the record, you know. But um, then I heard y'all's song, and I did, I've never heard it before. I'm like, this song's a smash. Thanks, man. And that was, like, one of my first... I had heard I hit Alabama, but I was like, that was like my one of the first like yeah. experiences, like my exposure to like your music. Thanks, man. That was cool. I, I might have told you the story, but uh, yeah, they they had cut the um, they had cut the scene of the movie to Creek Will Rise because the director loved that song so much, mm-hmm. and so they were they kept trying to get someone to beat it and like but have the same emotion. So finally, the week before they they called us, they were like, hey, can you just like write a very similar song? Um, <laughs> so we can put it in the movie, and so I literally sat down with uh, the co-writers Matt Matt Jenkins, Ben Johnson, Blake Pendergrass, um, and I was like, I was like, so how close do they want this? And they were like, I don't know, but like I think pretty close. So I literally just like same tempo, same chords, and then I just threw out a bunch of weather analogies, but it actually like it, it kind of became a little smash, and and mm-hmm. it's been doing really well. I mean, it's, super smash. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been streaming more than than we've actually ever done organically and then um and people are seeing it at the shows which is always the tell yeah uh, so th- that was like i said man that's just that was a wild little open door we got that was really cool we had uh we i went to the movie theater to see it like just kind of organically for the first time and uh same thing was just kind of waiting on the song the whole whole movie and uh, finally it came on i was like fired up i look over my wife she is passed out dead no. asleep, <laughs> just dead asleep so. oh, that's kind wake of... up yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, it was that's a really special thing. It's super cool, and honestly, I talk about that soundtrack. So I think good. that is going to be one that you look back on in twenty years, and like this is country music at part of its biggest, and this is the soundtrack that is the soundtrack. They crushed it. They yeah, hit, they hit a home run. I mean, they they hit the perfect kind of the perfect spot of just like uh, culture too, yeah. like for that movie and for that soundtrack. And uh, at any time something like that comes around Nashville, Nashville embraces their arms around mm-hmm. it. And, and so it was cool to uh, just see a lot of friends. I mean, that was like one of my favorite videos I've ever seen because I just got to go watch and like wait for all my friends' songs to get on there <laughs> and then to hear my own. It was just like a pretty surreal moment. Super great. And, and also the, the movie is just fun. Yeah, it's just, movie. there's it's all the tornadoes and shit. <laughs> you know, it's just, there's no like, 
buffer fat is just like the CGI trend. in that movie is unbelievable. Oh yeah, there's like a fire NATO, man. It's awesome. Just send it. Yeah. Have you seen it? No, I got to. You got to. I haven't been to the theater in so long. Yeah, well, you should have come to MetLife. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bud, I had to work. You know? yeah. <laughs> but it's that's I think another thing where when a movie that is that kind of big, right? Because Twisters has been a big franchise. Movie the summer, yeah. Yeah. When it's that and it's country artists, that tells you where country's at in oh, the world, man. you know? Dude, I saw a set the other day where, like, Luke has, like, four out of five of, like, the whatever it's called, like, quadruple platinum country songs ever. Like, he has, like, 75 or 80% Absurd. of them. It's like, I hear all these numbers. I just, I'm, like, lost in it now. I'm like... <laughs> Okay, so a billion yeah. streams on something, and it's like Stapleton has a billion, and Zach, I'm like, I get confused with all that stuff. The yeah. the it's thing cool. I remember when I had the radio show in Pittsburgh was talking to Mark Anderson, the program director. He was like, I could play Luke Combs' song every other yeah. song, yeah. and I would have better ratings yeah. than I have otherwise. Yeah. He's like, but I can't do that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But the other thing that you'll see in my head is, you still hear uh, Beer Never Broke My Heart on country radio. It's, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and you're probably going to for a long time. You still hear When It Rains It Pours on country radio, right? Like, that's the stuff. You still hear old Garth Brooks songs on country oh, radio. Yeah. You hear old Brooks and Dunn songs. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not in the current, if it's a current format station, you still see some of those classics. And Luke's got classics. Oh, yeah. And that's. Again, the stuff that these kids are hearing, like it's brand new to them the first time they hear it, not realizing that that's been out for, what, 10 years now? Almost? When it rains, it pours? No. Eight? No, because Hurricane was was the number one in in 2017. We went big at radio. So probably 2016, I would guess. Yeah, I was in five years. I think I was 16. Yeah. Um, But so Rains was the second single. Yeah. So that probably went to radio in 2018. So it probably came out six years. No, it was before that. But it probably came out before well, that. Yeah, before yeah. that. Yeah. But that's six that was years. Back then, when it like took Luke a little longer to to go number one on radio. Yeah, more than three weeks or whatever it does now. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, there's not many songs that are played when they're not going for number one on country radio oh anymore, gosh. right? And yeah. it has to be a song that is can affect people for a long period of time to get that you know again like brooks and dunn garth brooks like yeah just certain songs cut through it's just like this weird it's weird mystery and and luke has a couple of those you know (laughs) which is more than anyone else has right right but i'm talking just on mainstream radio you know which is still like when someone hears it for the first time it has that same impact it had when you heard it for the first time yeah 100 percent. you know i mean back to kind of timeless songs yeah and just to just to go back a little bit, talk about not knowing what they're doing. You know, I remember <laughs> Hurricane. It was the obvious song to go to radio, but then it was like it was like we didn't know what the next one was, and they were like going back and forth, back and forth. Now it seems so obvious. It was rains and pours, but for me, I'm like, it's like it didn't have an intro, and like the courses are all different. And I was like, is that is that it? Yeah, 100%. You know, of course it was. You know, yeah. in hindsight, which is something I didn't have at the time. Yeah, but it's just it's funny how and even like Oklahoma, Luke was like, should I put this to radio? I don't know. And then, you know, I was like, obviously. And then (laughs) but then some people were like, you know, it's like you never know. So, of course, he wanted to. But you just want to go to radio. You can play that. I just want to to play that live. live. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, I mean, I do believe that in that stuff. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah. You know, like because we've we've had first two singles died pretty early. Uh, but then meanwhile, we had I Hate Alabama, you know, which was doing its own thing and, you know, can still look back and go like, God, that should have gone to radio. You know, that should have been the first single. But I also go, I'm a lot better person because I've had some failures. You know, I'm yeah. a lot better person because I had I've had three songs die at radio now and mm-hmm. one gets a little bit of success with, with the top ten. Um, and so it's like I just think all oh, that happens for a reason. I think Luke was just ready at the time to become the next superstar and. So like the songs that were sp- uh, songs that were supposed to go to radio were going to go to radio, you know. Yeah, yeah. The world has a way of working out. Hundred percent. You know? Yeah, the worst night of your career has kind of been a blessing in a weird way. Yeah, now it's a funny story I tell on a podcast, mm-hmm. and everybody smiles about it. And it was it was a hundred percent a blessing. I remember telling my girlfriend. I remember telling Leah, uh, 
girlfriend at the time that uh my wife, that my wife, <laughs> my wife. Uh, still feels weird to say but uh no i remember telling her that after it happened i was just like this is so weird that, like everything that could have gone wrong went wrong you know it was such one of those situations i was like this was supposed to happen and whatever's on the other side is better and then like it, and it and it was you know it was chaotic for a while but like that was where jake came in the picture that was where the band guys i have now were hired that was where uh i was intro to cappy and then we kind of had the redemptive redemptive story and with flatland and everything and so like you know even in the bad stuff like everything everything turns around yeah but part of that is because you made effort to turn yeah, it sure. around right it doesn't just turn around it sure. takes True. you having moments where you're like, I'm going to make this. And you spoke that into existence, yeah. right? And that's part of believing in yourself, knowing the quality of the person you are, and doing that and pushing towards it. Well, thanks for saying that. But I don't know, man. I just, I think, uh, especially being, you know, young, kind of throughout the start of this journey. And now it's just like, I just kind of got to grow up along the way and, yeah. and allow myself to make mistakes and try to grow from them. And like I said, you know, before, like, yeah, if I, my first song had gone number one and the second one hit number one, dude, I would have, I'd probably be a douchebag. Maybe a huge you know? piece of shit, probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. You'd be a rich piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> I'd have a better house, but. <laughs> no, the, happiness doesn't live in a bigger house. Man, the, the thing, Kurt, and I talk about a lot is if, if I started this company when I was 25, it would be awful. You know, I, w I just wasn't emotionally ready to do that. Well, I mean, when talking to Luke, sorry to cut you off, but I know. when co when talking to Luke, he was like, he was like, dude, I, I didn't even move to town at your age. I picked up guitar the year before. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's just some things just take time, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you kind of, the, the hardest part about this job is the patience of it. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to learn that more and more. I mean, it's, it's hard and the mistakes are what makes you a better person. 100%. If you never made a mistake and you were godly all the time and never had anything in your head that you let come out that shouldn't have, For sure. right? That's, it's just, you're never going to grow Yeah. Well, and you might be great person, but you're going to be that exact same person forever, Yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas the best people have to have a bad story about something so that you have a good story, yeah. you know, and you know how not to do it is really how you learn to do it. Yeah. I mean, just that, that, and that emotion of this, like, uh, I hate the way that that looked, right. I hate mm -hmm. the way that the perception of that on me and, and whatever, it's like that elicit me going, okay, I have to grow up. I have to learn how to be a leader. I have to realize that like, Hey, these guys are going to follow my lead and yeah. you know, set a standard. Every artist has had that. We, 100%. I mean, you know, it's like, if you don't know about it, doesn't mean it didn't happen. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody, <laughs> everybody has. Yeah. I mean, yeah. To say the least. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's, man, being in the spotlight from the time that you're 20 years old is weird. Yeah. It's, it's different. And, you know, that's why just, you see like so many like child stars that have trouble. And I remember someone said, however old you are when you got famous. Oh, I was yeah. That's how old you are forever. I've been saying that. I've been saying that quote for a while. Yeah, it's so true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've seen it in a lot of people that like, however old you were when you get famous, like you just stop develop, you, mm -hmm. like your brain stops developing, uh, which is just crazy. But it's not that if you're cognizant of it, one hundred percent, right? If you are mindful so in aware. that you have to do that, and you're aware that you need to become an adult <laughs> and you need to be a great husband and you need to be a great boss and you need to be a great songwriter. Right. Yeah. And you need to be a great son, mm -hmm. you know, that then you will grow. Well, you become, that happens if you put your identity in it, right? Yeah. If your identity becomes being that person, you know, then you're always, I mean, I won't name names, but we played a show this summer with a, a very legendary older band and like, was talking to one of the main guys in it and like he had a like 80s they were in their 80s and he had like a 27 year old girlfriend and i was just like what is happening and then i thought of that quote like because if you put your identity in that like you'll always see yourself as that age yeah versus just it's what luke does so well that it's like dude he's so disassociated with mm -hmm. with being luke combs that you're always you know he's you know a great father a great husband and you know always looking at trying to become better 
Having a girlfriend in their 20s when you're in the 80s just sounds like a pain in the ass to sounds me. Awful. <laughs> sounds awful. Sounds terrible. Ha- dating a t- 27-year-old when I was 38 was awful. Yeah. You know? yeah, <laughs> Can't even imagine. Sure. It's, Ugh. But it's... Uh, That's a podcast for a different yeah, time. It's a, it's, sure. it's a different <laughs> podcast for sure. But um, part of it is knowing who you are. Oh, for sure. Right? And that's the greatest artists know who they are as a person. Not just who they are on stage. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I, I've told people before. I think that's one of the hardest things about being so young and doing this is like this constant pressure to always know who you are. You mm-hmm. know, because that is the whole thing. You know, you're selling to the fan or you know the the presenting. You know who you are and whatever. And it's like, man, I don't know. I'm mm-hmm. 23, just turning 24. I got no idea. Yeah, we'll figure just, it out along the way. We'll figure it out along the way. And if every mistake you made was something that no one would let you come back from, yeah, then no one would ever grow, right? right? So that's part of life is mistakes. Part of music is relatability. And if you didn't make any mistakes, you won't be very relatable. Oh, for sure. You know, it's it's just not how the world works. Yeah. Well, man, thank you so much for being on this podcast with us. This has been a great one. No, I I really enjoyed it, and thanks for, thanks for having me. Thank you for accepting my uh, my. I guess I invited myself. So thanks for. (laughs) You're always welcome, man. We love when people do that. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Um, No, this was really fun, and and respect you guys, and respect the wisdom. So thanks for uh, yeah having a good combo. Yeah, appreciate it, brother. Well, my name's Kurt Ozon. I'm Nikki T. And we'll see you you on the the front front row. row.